All right, everybody. I encourage anyone who hasn't found a seat yet to please find a comfortable place. I will point out that there are pop, there's popcorn, M&Ms, and other mix-ins for a little extra entertainment down here, just in case anyone didn't quite get enough supper. I'm Neil Smatras, the president of the University of North Texas, and I'm proud to welcome you here to this event tonight, which is going to be great. It's the first of the presidential lecture series. We established it today. <laughs> And we did so by inviting a terrific speaker and someone who I think you will all really be able to relate to because he has both academic origins, but he has a mission now that is truly intergalactic. Uh, this is my gift, if you will, to the UNT community and to North Texas. And I hope as time goes on, people who are both town and gown will come to appreciate the kinds of lecture series the intellectual content, the academic content, the social value of what we're bringing to them. I want to remind all of you that we have a mission. Our purpose here is to prepare the creative leaders of tomorrow. Lectures like this will help to serve to do that as well as inspire through imagination the kinds of creativity and innovation that we believe we bring to this region. So today, we want to inspire all of you to soar higher. And I think you're going to hear about a lot higher today. And so introducing uh, Dr. Thomas Zubrookin will be someone who is close to him, who as number two in all of NASA ran many different divisions that were responsible for bringing you the incredible discoveries that we are now accustomed to attaching NASA's name to. And that is our current chancellor and friend of, the U of UNT and the UNT system, <clears throat> Lisa Rowe. Thank you, Lisa. So this is one of those just awesome days for me because I get to introduce Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. He is an amazing scientist, a true leader, an innovative thinker, a colleague, and a great friend. Thomas is at the helm of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, and if you want to know just how huge that is, it includes the Earth, it includes the Sun, it includes the solar system, it includes the universe. How big is that? And, uh, and so under the Science Mission Directorate is over $6 billion in missions that are in development or in operations and all the research that comes with that. And uh, before coming to, uh, to NASA, Thomas was the professor of space science and aerospace engineering at the University of Mission, Michigan in Ann Arbor. Be and uh, he is the university's founding director of the Center for Entrepreneurship in the College of Engineering there. Thomas's experience includes research in solar and heliophysics, experimental space research, space systems, and innovation and entrepreneurship. He uh, has a PhD in physics from the University of Bern in Switzerland and numerous honors and awards. One of my best days in NASA was when I was on the plane with Thomas for the 2017 solar eclipse. And I got to watch Thomas in action. It was truly inspirational as he was just, all the science was coming in and we had the instruments on the plane. And he was describing it into, in someone like me in a way that I could actually understand it, which was just fantastic. It was great to watch him in action and was truly one of the best days that I've had in NASA. Thomas also helped me to, to decide to come to the University of North Texas system. He was one of the first person I re reached to when I, was, uh, when I was deciding to come this way. So I don't know if you, you can blame him or thank him one way or the other, but, it was, but I really truly uh, valued his advice and his leadership in making that decision. So Thomas, thanks for your advice, for your wisdom, your friendship, and your inspiration. And thank you for spending so much time with our students today. Uh, he just, that was what Thomas really truly wanted to do when he was here. So thank you for that. And for all of you in the audience, I give you Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. Thanks so much.
what an exciting day I've had uh, today. I started in Washington, D.C. and learned all about fixing planes and how sometimes that leads to delays. And then, of course, weather happened. And everything worked despite all that. I actually came two minutes late. And I just had a wonderful day hanging out with uh, faculty and with students, uh, with uh, some of your deans, some of your academic leaders. And you couldn't be more fortunate to have uh, these leaders at the helm. In fact, I, the one thing I said over dinner, I just want to uh, repeat it here, probably the one thing that I learned, uh, probably if I came up with one adjective uh, that describes the faculty, it's caring. Uh, you could not believe so many things were said without any students there that gave me that impression. And of course, that's how I also felt when I saw the students. I really felt like they were in a place that was uh, surrounded by people who cared. Uh, people who want them to be successful. And of tomorrow. So what I want to talk to you about is about a word that is kind of a mouthful and it's kind of transformation. And I want to talk about science and transformation, but uh, if I do it well, hopefully when everything is said and done, you'll be able to exchange science uh, into what you uh, want to have uh, your impact in, uh, where you want to lead, and uh, you'll basically uh, think about what you can do to transform, namely to leap to a new level, to bring a new level of understanding to bear, to open up a new set of innovative space. I want to talk about what that means in science, and my hope is uh, you'll learn it there. I want to start with uh, true wisdom here, and I'm going to read this here, and that is that action without vision is only passing time. Vision without action is merely daydreaming, but vision with action can change the world. Of course, a quote by Nelson Mandela. I'm going to talk about two, those two things. Vision, which is really important. It's grabbing an idea that's in the future. It's so elusive that most people don't even see it, and bringing it out of the future into the present. That's what vision is about. The only way you do that, Nelson Mandela said, is by acting. It's by doing things, specific things, learning how to do those things, and frankly, little steps sometimes, sometimes backward step, but keep doing, bringing action to bear. He said, vision alone is not helpful. Action alone is not helpful. Together, they can change the world. They can transform, and that's really what I'm going to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about some of the missions that we're working on right now. And I want to talk about where the vision component is, but I want to talk about some of the things that remain hidden to people who are not looking under the cover that are just as important for achieving the transformation of our understanding than the vision is in the first place. It turns out sometimes our reward systems uh, don't reward the action people as much as the vision people. And I just want to make sure that you understand, those of your students, and those, of course, are wisdom uh, uh, beyond uh, you know, the student level and even beyond uh, where I'm at, they understand this, this, is, this is really trivial. Uh, they, they know that very instinctively. You have to focus on both. So I want to talk to you about this. And uh, the way I think about it, some of you are, where's the math, the math team there? There you are. Yeah, there you are. So, so I want to talk about how a particle propagates in a turbulent fluid. So this is a model, a uh, particle propagating a turbulent fluid. And so basically what happens is the particle starts somewhere, and it gets bumped around a little bit. And it makes little, tiny little steps. You see them there. Of course, I went backwards right now. Didn't want to do that. You see the tiny little steps. Every once in a while, they take a leap. It turns out that much of nature is organized such that actually if you want to calculate how much progress you make, how, how far that particle moves, it takes the little steps, but it takes the big leaps for the mathematicians. Those are the levy flights, of course, uh, in a non-Gaussian fluid. So basically the point is what I'm going to talk to you about. Progress in real life is just like that. Little bumps, little steps, going backwards, going forwards, all of a sudden take the real leap because of what you were always ready because you had that vision uh, right there and you were ready for it. You took the leap when you could. So I want to talk about that. So remember that picture for those of you who are geeks like me. Uh, that, that helps me. I want to talk about 
one of those. Uh, and uh, kind of, this is our anniversary here at NASA, and so at, at the Apollo program. And, and of course, uh, for us, uh, the world opened up, space opened up by that little rocket. Uh, first of all, the most important thing we see is Van Allen in the middle is shorter than the two others. Do you see how it's on his toes? Uh, as Pickering and uh, Werner von Braun are holding up uh, the rocket. This, of course, was a response to being behind, being beaten. The Sputnik had flown over, uh, American heads, uh, antennas set, uh, noticed that, yes, the space is open now, uh, not by our own uh, innovation, but by innovators elsewhere that actually scared us a little bit, uh, scared our parents a little bit, perhaps. And so what came together is a crash program beyond belief. Uh, within just a few months, Van Allen, in the middle there, who had a Geiger counter, you know, the stuff that you use in the lab to measure uh, radioactivity, the little, you know, clicking device. That's what he had there, except an electronic version. And uh, Pickering, over here on the left, who knew how to take that and put it into a system that actually sent the data down and actually uh, did the work and Von Braun, uh, the rocket man, uh, who uh, after World War II, of course, came to the U.S., uh, a tremendous innovator uh, that uh, uh, on the rocket side. So together, they did a crash program, and I talked to some of those people, and it's incredible that it worked, frankly. But together, they did it. Now, what's really important is that the number three here. By the way, there's others. But the thing is, it's not Van Allen. You know, the space is named after him now, the Van Allen belts. You know, it's pretty cool. It's part of the space as your name. That's, I, mean, I once walked into a senator's office, like, do you know that a guy in your district has the pay, you know, part of space named after him. That's pretty cool, but nobody else has that in any other uh, district. So, so Van Allen is there, but, uh, but, but he couldn't do it alone. Neither did the rocket guy, neither did Pickering. Uh, together, the engineer, the systems person, and the scientist came together and created that, that transformation. A transformation, at the end, would look like a total loss, because as this rocket went up, everybody expected that there would be more radiation, all of a sudden there was no radiation. And it took quite a while to figure out that the reason there was no measurement of radiation with that Geiger counter is because the Geiger counter was choking. Is there so much that the Geiger counter was flooded and basically said zero, zero, zero. Not because there was zero, it's because there's too many, too much radiation. The Van Allen belts full of radiation out there. So for me, that's an important part. At the beginning of the space age also is this picture. So for me, it's science hiding out in plain sight. You see, of course, uh, Buzz Aldrin back there, a uh, very colorful personality, uh, who, uh, of course, uh, is one of the two uh, moonwalkers of Apollo 11. But what he put up there is a piece of chocolate paper. I'm saying that. It's because made out of aluminum. It's, it's really expensive chocolate paper. There's also some platinum in it. And it was done in Switzerland. So the first experiment on the moon was an international experiment. See the importance of bringing together in that vision all the relevant players that could do this. This is the simplest experiment that anybody has ever conceived, I believe. Basically, open up that ball, stick it in the ground, and wait. Uh, by the way, you want to stick it in the ground so the sun is to your left. You see the shadow at the bottom? And so basically what happens when, because the moon doesn't have a magnetic field, the sun is blowing its atmosphere. It's so hot, it's blowing its atmosphere into that boy. And it just implanted itself there. When everything was said and done, Buzz Aldrin rolled it up and brought it back to the US and then all over the, the world, including Switzerland, where I did my PhD. Uh, and so basically, uh, even before I was there, it's that analysis of that solar sample that was the best measurement of all noble gases of the sun and the solar system. Not because this is the most complex thing, it's because the details of how that has to be done, that boy. The engineering of actually learning how to fake that out in every way was necessary to create that transformation of knowledge. Not just the vision of going there on the moon. That was also important, really, really important. They, they, they required both. By the way, I, I wrote a paper that for the first time beat the accuracy of that measurement. This, of course, was done um, you know, in the, in the, in the 60s, uh, the accuracy was exceeded in the late 90s. That's how long this was the best measurement ever. 
the simplest mathematical device, vision and action together. That picture, of course, is full of stories. Uh, in many ways, you know, many people focus on Apollo 11. This is where the US overtook uh, the Soviets at that point uh, during Apollo 8 when, when basically the riskiest of all missions, I would argue, uh, kind of with a lot of things. For example, the engine that was used to get out of lunar orbit had not worked the test before. And so they went up there. If it didn't work, they're not coming back. So went up there and took that measurement that, of course, stands for vision when we look at it. To look at the Earth from the outside, to look at the Earth from behind the moon. And that's really what uh, vision stands for. But behind that is a team of people that can uh, create that action. So that's where it started. Uh, kind of in the light, late 80s, many of some of you were not even born then, but you know, I was kind of kicking around. In boldface are the missions that we were working on in all of science. You see the Earth, uh, Lisa Rowe talked about it, uh, by the sun, kind of looking at the sun, the space environment. In boldface are all the ones we were working on in regular font are the ones that were flying already. So you see, this is the few are flying. There were a lot of missions that were working on. The Voyagers were already flying. Uh, and that, you know, Voyagers were with me my entire life. Uh, the last uh, nature paper, I believe, I read about this was just last year. So they're still creating amazing science. But you see this, a lot of was working on. This is where we are today. So basically, I'm going to spare you the work. Uh, if you added them up, it's 105 missions. And this is what this initial work opened up. It's the ability for us to look at the Earth in a way that helps us understand the Earth as a complex system, gives us a view of the globe in a way that we've never imagined. Uh, we also, of course, uh, recognize that in the middle of the solar system is our star, kind of the Rosetta Stone for all stars. Everything we've ever learned, pretty much. Everything we've ever learned about stars, we learned there first. There are stars that are so crazy you can't learn at the sun, like neutron stars and black holes, you know, different. But the vast majority of stars work just a little bit like that. Some of them are too heavy, some of them are too light, but we learned it there. And then, of course, these planetary worlds, you've seen them in your school books, you've seen them on, on pictures on your wall, and then uh, the deep universe. So what I'm going to do now is I take a few of those stories and tell them, kind of in the point, from the point of view of vision and action. Uh, not all of these missions, uh, otherwise you'd have to, you know, get sleeping bags in here. We don't want to do that. But uh, what I want to talk to you about is, is a picture of the Earth. This is actually made out of three different uh, data sources. And of course, what you see is, first of all, our amazing planet, uh, full of water. Uh, water very much related to life, we believe, uh, on any planet, but certainly on this one. And uh, of course, an atmosphere that brings all kinds of variability for us, but also havoc at times. Uh, here, three hurricanes are in the basin, uh, barreling towards the US and Florence is the one uh, that's, uh, that's ahead of it. And frankly, what we're doing about these hurricanes, so first of all, the story about these hurricanes uh, in 2018, what you can look about is, is, of course, we have the data, we have these amazing images. The story about the last hurricane season is the accuracy of prediction is unprecedented. A lot of the work that happened, the accuracy of the rainfall, for example, uh, the accuracy of wind speed, where it hit, was never, it was unprecedented in previous years. How do you get there? Of course, you have to create these spacecraft, create the vision, but it, what happens is these modelers, these data analysts that take that data and put them to bear and basically keep innovating. Take this one. I met today with a CubeSat group, uh, kind of a, a group that does uh, uh, build spacecraft that you can, you know, are as big as a, a loaf of bread or a toaster. You can throw them to a farm to another, even though I don't recommend that necessarily. Uh, so this is a CubeSat that's out there and actually took active measurements of that particular hurricane with a CubeSat in a way that's unprecedented. So we have uh, up to, I, I don't know, if I added them up, endurance value or otherwise, it's probably $15 billion worth of spacecraft up there looking at the Earth. This one was done for like 5 million or so, and it creates a measurement that we've never seen. 
But that's what I mean with that action, right? Of course, we want to make predictions. We want to save lives. That's uh, what earth science is really at the heart of earth science, is that ability to have impact in society. But these are measurements that are so important for forecasts we believe in the future that we want to see more of. But the first one, we had it up there. The first hurricane, we did the measurement on. Frankly, it turned a lot of heads because many people said you can never do any measurements from a CubeSat where you can beat what the big spacecraft can do. Here's your proof. There's many, by the way. So, and second one, I'm going to talk about it later. I want to talk about a story in Hawaii. Uh, this is the uh, main island. And of course, uh, the thing that you want to know about Hawaii is uh, if there was a continental shift on Earth, there would be a mega massive volcano over there. And every time, every once in a while, it will push like gas and lava up. But since there's continental shift, the continents are floating, floating, floating. So our volcanoes are not that huge, but there's many of them. And this is the most active one. The reason I'm telling you that, I'm going to talk to you about Mars, where there's no continental shift. So the mega volcano is there. Just remember, uh, that's, that's the difference. So, so basically, what happens here is we look at Hawaii. By the way, the color code here is about learning about the crop, where what crop, what type of farm product grows where. And uh, we can do that by analyzing uh, data over several years. Now what happened, of course, uh, you know this is from a helicopter image, so it's not a NASA image. Uh, the uh, credit is up there. Uh, from a, what happens, these volcanoes are creating havoc in the lives of uh, the population there. And you see that there's uh, this, this outpouring of lava is, of course, uh, destroying these houses, but is, is, is really affecting su substantially the whole look and feel, everything, including the farmland of, of these islands. So what we're doing at NASA is we're looking at it from space. So what we're doing is we're overflying it uh, on NASA's Terra spacecraft, uh, uh, a spacecraft that we didn't know that we're going to do that when we were there. It's the researchers that basically look at the ability of creating impact by taking data that are there and analyzing them in a new way and actually uh, predicting and, and uh, providing a global context of the damage that is there uh, in these environments. So it's these kind of uh, impacts that are really passionate to us because, again, each one of them the transformation that happens here is it changes lives. It's fundamental research that's motivated by applications. It changes lives in a direct fashion. That's what transformation can, be look, can, transformation can look like. And that's uh, what's really at the heart in many different ways of Earth science. I want to talk about another story. Uh, this, of course, is in the Antarctic. Um, I don't know whether you could tell. There's no penguin. But uh, uh, basically, uh, what uh, what we're doing here is actually learning how the ice shields of the Earth are evolving. Now it turns out that every once in a while we talk to an Earth scientist, and uh, perhaps like five years ago, we talked to an Earth scientist and everything looks really certain. Now, if you want certainty, it's really hard to be a scientist. A scientist is all about doubt. We question, like the way we become confident about a statement is we try to kill it. We try, there's a theory, we try to take it out, we test it, we kick it, we stand on it, we turn it upside down. And if it's still alive, after all these tests, it's a good theory. That's why we believe some of the statements that are there, not because we lock in and we don't, we're not critical. So one of the things we try to understand is how does the ice evolve in the Antarctic? It actually turns out that even five years ago, we only knew the snowfall in the Antarctic within a factor of 50%. It turns out that's important. You know, remember, ice melt is snow that falls minus what melts. So if you don't know one of these within 50%, you don't really know what's happening there. So that's what we're doing. We're going there on the ground. And we're going on the ground with a scientists who are calibrating and validating data that are flying over. Of course, we can measure one point. We have GPS. We're, we're, we're there multiple years. We overfly it with airplanes. But then we overfly it with spacecraft. This is a spacecraft that only three weeks of data of that spacecraft of the Antarctic. Now, if you imagine that spacecraft, so it's, it's basically a big refrigerator. 
and there are eight laser points that are shooting down many times per second. And what we're measuring, we know the speed of light is constant, right? In one of every test we've ever done, speed of light is constant in vacuum. So, so basically, uh, so we go down with these laser dots, and what we do is we measure um, the extent of ice, the height of ice, as a function of time. We do so, by the way, the previous measurement, you're all football fans here, right? So the previous measurement, basically at the spatial, you're not. The previous measurement had the spatial resolution of, of a football field. This measurement has the spatial resolution of one yard. And we do it from space. And within three weeks, that's the measurement we're taking. And we're calibrating it there. Now, I'm not going to talk about the conclusions of this. What I want to tell you, that's what transformation comes from. So it's, it's by the way, uh, Lisa knows about this mission, I said too. It's a mission where the laser entirely failed. So everything was being built, and the company was supposed to build that laser. You know, a laser that survives launch when you get it up there, a laser that actually works for the years that are there with an accuracy that, that you know within five millimeters what the distance is, which is the height accuracy. I gave you the spatial accuracy of one meter, five millimeters in the other direction. To do that, the company couldn't deliver. We actually were not successful to deliver the, the mission for the initially agreed upon price. And we needed to go back and actually add some money. It's something we never like to do. We never want to uh, tell the taxpayer we use more money than we guessed we would. In this case, we had to. Many of the other missions, we didn't. This one, we had to. But I could not tell you how proud I was of that team when we were up there. We launched. I've told everybody about this story when we launched about how hard it was. And when we were up there, and every one of those lasers worked just like it should, it there was not a single issue during the entire startup of that laser that basically um, that prevented us from doing these measurements with only within three weeks. We expected this kind of chart within months. So for me, that's what transformation is about. Now, this is the good work of individuals. Many names I'll never know. Sometimes I bump into them but they make it work, not the guy I talk to, not me. I'm the vision guy when I'm standing here. But it's that piece that really is mattering. Again, when you look at these data, think of that. The transformation of our understanding that will have huge societal impact comes from not just the recognition that we can do that measurement, it's from those measurements. It's also the guy who drives the truck on the ice and calibrates it, because our, without that calibration, we actually cannot do it at the accuracy that's needed. I want to talk about another one, and that is a little bit about patience. Of course, that's our star, the sun. Sun is magnetic, it turns out. So it's kind of like a you know, frying pan with uh, boiling oil. Uh, it's not oil. It's uh, hydrogen mostly. But, but uh, uh, the, the arcs that you see is magnetic fields, the magnetic fields that we have, a steady magnetic field on the, on the Earth. But we have that uh, sun uh, that's there and boiling like a pot. Well, what happens is the atmosphere of that star, the surface of that star, is 6,000 degrees Kelvin. That's hot. The atmosphere of it is one and a half million. Now think about it. Suppose you went to a campfire, and here's the fire, and you're here, your face is hot. Then you walk back here, and your face burns. It's way hotter. That's how the sun works, right? That violates, you know, for these things. Uh, thermodynamics works that well. It only, if you, do, if you do thermodynamics, you have to take into account all heat flux and all energy flux, including the magnetic one. And so get off the, the corona that Lisa and I saw on that plane. By the way, if you want to see our experience, it's on YouTube. Just Google the both of our na names together. There's only one movie, uh, us, us there kind of talking about it. But, uh, but uh, basically, that recognition that that atmosphere drives an outflow of solar material is a recognition that this guy in the middle, Gene Parker, uh, when he took this picture, is he 91 years old. He made that recognition at the age of 26. He almost got fired. Actually, he lost his job uh, over it because it was so controversial. His paper was not accepted. And he, based on, for the wisdom of the guy who sat next to him in the office, a guy called John Gosecka, who's, of course, a Nobel Prize winner, but, but basically overruled the referees 
his paper got published that said there is such an outflux of uh, solar material. And for the first time in history did we name a mission after a person who's alive. So see behind him is the rocket. Uh, the, the guy, you see the guy in the red tie, it's got different tie. I, I really do own more than one tie. But, uh, but, the, uh, but the other guy is the CEO of uh, United Launcher Lines who built that, uh, that uh, rocket there. And I can tell you how I felt standing next to Parker uh, and his family in tears where that rocket went up. It took well over 50 years for us to be able to go measure that source of that solar wind that he had predicted in that paper in 58. Uh, uh, and he went up there. Right now we're taking measurements. They're incredible measurements of a spacecraft that is really hard. Now the most important part, if you want to fly to the sun, is guess what? A heat shield, right? If you don't have a heat shield, you're not going to make it. You fly towards the sun, and on the other side comes a bunch of dust. Well, so what, what happened here at the front of the uh, spacecraft is a heat shield. You see that white thing in the middle? The rest is just a holder. That heat shield had to be invented. So I remember I, I let talked to the lead engineer. There she is in the front uh, with the head against, the, against you, the back of the head against you. I talked to her about that heat shield. All she was thinking about, all she was dreaming about is that heat shield. I remember walking in with Parker and looking at the heat shield. All Parker wanted to talk about, you know, uh, is that heat shield. Because he knew that that heat shield decides whether that mission works or not. That's what I mean with action. That's what I mean with action. It's that deliberate work, doing something the best way possible, not just doing the right, not just doing great things, doing it the best way possible and recognizing that that's there. That's uh, what you can see when you see that mission. So when you read about that mission, think of her, think of that team building that heat shield with their, uh, with their team, with their companies that, that built that. By the way, it's super light. It's basically made out of nothing. You know, it's a foam, basically, and uh, it's working like a charm. In fact, we flew by the sun for the first time. Uh, we had no problems whatsoever, no lost data. Basically, the spacecraft flew li just like it should, and the heat shield worked like a charm without uh, any uh, thing. That's not because of some mission gap. It's because of that action, the patience that it takes to build that kind of mission. Yes, we can elevate our sights and look far beyond into the deep universe. Every once in a while, I want to remind you that if you take a penny, and there's this head on it, and you look at the eye of that head, and you hold it out at arm's length, and just look at that eye. You look at against the sky. Behind that eye, in the sky, I saw observed by the Hubble Space Telescope are 6,000 galaxies anywhere you point. 6,000 galaxies. This is a few. So this is a picture taken in a place where there was nothing. And it's just it sat there for 50,000 seconds. And what you see is these galaxies. You've never seen any one of them. It's just as complex as ours. We happen to call our, our home. But that's the galaxy. Talk about vision. Talk about transformation. I always say to people, like, close your eyes and think of space, what you see. I don't know, I see that. Uh, many people say Star Trek, I don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, the point is, you think about galaxy. Close your eyes, think of galaxy, what you see. You see a Hubble picture. Everywhere on Earth, you see a Hubble picture. And uh, what we're trying to do is actually create a spacecraft that by far exceeds what we've been do doing so far in two ways. First of all, see the mirror? There's one piece missing. Uh, that's six and a half meters. Um, what is that? 29 feet? About. So in diameter, it unfolds. 22 feet. See, I don't do feet. I do meters. I have two feet, but not more. Anyway, so 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 uh, so basically, six and a half meters uh, in diameter. So it's big because we want to look back in time, far beyond where Hubble saw. And because it's so far back in time, the university is expanding, it's really cold there. So what we want to do, we need to cool down that mirror to a temperature that we've never cooled any spacecraft before. The way we do that is there's five tennis court size uh, foils 
that we're expanding in space. So if you're the sun putting up those tennis size court uh, um, uh, shields, and so I'm cooling down on the other side to only a few de degrees Kelvin. So only at that temperature can we see the first galaxies. We can see back in time in a, in a place we've never seen. Okay, now I can tell you, the vision pitch, five minutes and you have it. Doing this, eight billions later and we're still not done. And at the end, it's simple things. One of the perturbations we had, one of the big problems we had is fasteners were not attached properly. This is the most complex telescope. The reason I'm telling you that is not to make anybody feel bad. My point is, the best vision people can come up with the best stories. If you, if your employee is not fastening the fasteners the right way, it's all over. It takes that action, it takes that focus to create the transformation. And only two or three people not buying into that with the scrutiny that it takes, with the focus, with the intention, with questioning the colleague, did you do it right? Show me, not just believing, only a few mistakes like that. And we cannot deliver on time. I'm telling you that to tell you it's hard. It's hard because it requires everybody's action not just the leader's actions. And those of you who are in engineering, I met a bunch of you, you're gonna learn that, the hard way or the easy way. From the beginning, recognize that the people you work with, some of them may have lesser degrees than you, they may be more important than you at certain parts in building these uh, spacecraft. I remember spending a Christmas day next to my mechanical technician when we built a space instrument that went to planet Mercury that I designed. Because at that Christmas day, the only thing I could do to help him is bring him food. He's much better than me with that machine. But I felt I needed to be there because he gave up his Christmas break to finish that instrument. So don't forget that, that's what action takes. It's that commitment to success, to buying into the vision. The vision is important. Otherwise he doesn't know why it's worth doing that. Vision is important also for him, but sitting there and doing it, that's what you should see when you want to see there. So, of course, um, you read a lot and uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, thinking about how to take humans out of low Earth orbit. One of the most exciting things for us is after the Apollo program is we learned how to live in space. There's humans have been there for well over a decade without break. That's great, we learned how to do that. But we're lear learning organization. We wanna take them out of low Earth orbit and towards the moon and eventually to Mars. It's a really hard vision. And at the end, uh, what we have to do is learn how to land again on the moon. Actually, what we're doing right now is actually recognize that we actually don't wanna do the same thing we did in the 60s at all. What we wanna do is build a commercial sector that knows how to land. So we're betting on them. So here, action means show what you can do. There's many people who say they can do this, but see who can. Only the ones that can relate vision and action to each other can create that uh, transformation. And so basically, actually one of the elements uh, that we're gonna focus on is this command module in orbit around the moon from which a lot of these activities are gonna uh, go forward with. And on that uh, command station will be astronauts near the moon. Some of them will go down to the surface of the moon. Some of them will stay up there to work. And for science, we're part of this because we have questions at the moon. Even five years ago, we didn't know how to, we didn't know how to ask. There's many questions uh, about the moon that talks about the history of the Earth, the history of the solar system. And we know because we studied Mercury, we studied the Earth, and we wanna learn about uh, these questions. And one of the things uh, that uh, in each one of those cases will be critical is to recognize that that sun that I talked to you about, which is this, this solar wind comes out, is actually a source of radiation. Radiation that under certain circumstances is a risk for astronauts. So I would predict that the first science experiment to be put on that command module is gonna be a radiation experiment because again, with the uh, 
with the volcanoes. We want to predict that space weather, the storms, because at the end, that's the only way uh, we're ever going to be very confident that everybody is healthy and protected uh, with that. Of course, there's many layers of security we're going to wrap around that. So we're not going to depend on one single forecaster, not saying that. But we want to contribute to that, just the same way we do on Earth for the humans that are uh, off Earth. So once we look at the moon, of course, we see uh, the Mars uh, right waiting uh, out there. And I want to kind of tell you uh, the last story about it. And kind of that there, the action ta talks about everything about teamwork. So I want to tell you a story. Of course, it has to do with Mars. I uh, look at Mars until something like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mars looks like a planet that has, of course, a, the biggest volcano. We already talked about that, Mount Olympus. But it also has these things that look like riverbeds. In fact, some of the drawings by French scientists said way past looking through a telescope said, that looks like riverbeds. Well, asserting that and proving it are two different things, it turns out. It took centuries to do that. Well, so we landed on uh, Mars, and we landed with rovers, uh, the last one of which uh, we com uh, the mission we uh, announced complete two weeks ago, uh, opportunity. We landed there and we found that, in fact, when you're there, Mars looks exactly like some desert in Nevada, right? It's, it's like it used to be water there. There's minerals on the ground that only exist when there's water, but it's, it's gone. Frankly, something happened with Mars that catapulted it from a, from a place that had a magnetic field, that had an atmosphere, that had water in a large fraction of the surface, up to 150 meters of depth to something that's pretty dry. Now it turns out, there used to be a lot of water, there's still water there. But not as broadly distributed as we, as we thought, there's water on the desert. Now, landing on Mars, turns out, is a really hard thing. So humanity's record of landing on Mars is 40%. In other words, 60% of all missions never worked. What I'm going to tell you is a story of landing there. And so basically, the way we did it is, of course, uh, we launched it. And what we launched are actually three spacecraft. Remember the CubeSats our fans are working on? Uh, the CubeSats, there are two CubeSats. We call them the Marcos. I don't know, Mars something. You know, you start with Marco and say, what could it mean, right? So I don't know. But uh, anyway, the two Marcos. And then as a lander that went there. Now, what the lander is looking at is actually, for the first time, looking at the inside of Mars. It's kind of a robotic geologist looking on the inside of Mars to actually see whether that big transition that read from a, from a wet planet to a dry planet, from one without magnetic field to one without, whether that came from the inside. It could very well be that that was geologic source. So I'm going to do that for the first time. So the way we have to do this is fly out there and then land. Now, Landing on the moon, okay, landing on Earth basically means you go in and you let the atmosphere break you, slow you down, right? Kind of, the, kind of get a heat shield, you basically, the, the drag is so big, it starts glowing, but it slows you down. So the atmosphere helps you. Then you use parachutes and you're done. It's still hard, very hard, but we're pretty good at it. You land on the moon, or tonight, the Japanese are landing on Ryugu. Go look on Twitter tonight at, uh, I think, in three hours. They should touch down. The way you do that, there's no atmosphere. You use boosters, right? Kind of just kind of boost a little bit out and kind of just go down slowly. You land on Mars, it's hell because there's an atmosphere. So you can't ignore the atmosphere. The boosters won't do it. But it's not good enough. So it's just enough to be a headache. It doesn't really slow you down. And so you need to do everything I just said, and then some, to actually slow down, which is why it's so hard. Now, the problem was, if we want, we landed on the backside of Mars. So the only way to actually see whether the landing worked, we needed the signal to be bounced back. So think of these Marco spacecraft like mirrors. They listen to what's coming up and sending it back. So what's really exciting to me about the Marco spacecraft, I'm going to point him out. The black shirt, he's going to sit there. He's my former student. He's the lead engineer. And so for me, 
kind of those of your professors, you know immediately how that feels, right? Because you, if your students are better than you are, that's what you would like to see, right? No, no pride involved in that. Everything is great when that happens. So there I'm at. So we're building that beam. We're building that, um, uh, uh, setting up that landing. Now, it's nerve wracking. So the way that means for my job, I prepare that landing in two ways. About that amount of my briefing book is the good case. This is what I'm going to say if everything works. About that amount of the briefing is the bad case. Because somebody needs to get to the microphone. That's me. Right? So I'm getting ready for it. I'm nervous, right? Because there's nothing I can do. I tell you what helped me, though. One guy said, like, those of us who have built stuff, they, they see it in others. He's like, let's go to the meeting of the navigators. So I sat in that room, and I sat in a room with the, the oldest person in there is the guy who did the entry, descent, and landing for the Viking. He's like, he walks on water, as far as I'm concerned, right? He's tremendously capable, kind of wise beyond anybody. I mean, there's nobody in earth who knows more about entry, descent, and landing. Around the table, there are some of these other people. You're going to see them in red uh, shirts. Uh, some of them I actually knew when they were students. Uh, one of them, uh, she just started a couple years ago, and they were arguing with each other. They're looking at the data and are trying to understand the data. We actually realized 24 hours before we landed that we were coming in long. So we're basically going to go beyond the field that we had mapped out into a place where there's rocks. And we didn't want to do that. So we needed to make a correction, which means we have to turn the spacecraft around, boost back, and get into orientation again to land. We never want to do that. Of course, if you build it right, it will work. That's that accent part. Uh, within the last 40, 24 hours, both CubeSats, one of the CubeSats disappeared for six hours. It booted itself. It's not as stable as they advertise sometimes. Uh, uh, the other one had a, had a star sensor problem. So I'm there. But I saw this team with diverse opinions figuring out what's happening. I was never more confident that we're going to be successful because there's no team anywhere on Earth that I'd rather work with than that team right now. So what I'm going to show you is kind of the moment uh, that led uh, to that. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain launch status. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. The radar looking down. Standing by for lander separation. Lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 20 meters. 17 meters. Standing by for touchdown. This is one of those images. Uh, I want to tell you the next day, in hundreds of newspapers, this was on a front page, including the newspaper in Tehran, which is run by the religious government. At the front page was that picture. Exploration, if exploration, vision and action come together, it unites us. It brings us together in a way that pretty much nothing else can, because it, it basically transcends what we can be as humans, kind of what we alone can do, because the teams come together and lift us to that. And so for me, I don't know what you're into. I don't know how you have an impact in your local community, in the world as a whole. But I just want you to rem remember that, bring together that vision and that action. And I, I, uh, for those of you who are thinking about NASA, I'm going to uh, just run another uh, quick spot. By the way, this picture of that CubeSat is a picture that it sent down. By the way, it didn't drop a single frame. So the entire uh, data came down. The, the CubeSats performed superbly. 
uh, because of the work uh, of the people uh, that, that does. I couldn't be more proud of them. And this is a selfie uh, on the ground. Uh, you see the instruments uh, that are there. In the meantime, we actually put the seismology instrument out there on the ground and covered it up. The second instrument we, we placed uh, last week and, and uh, basically are uh, s starting to hammer it into the ground uh, in the next couple of weeks. And so that's what, what you can do if you know how to land on Mars. Uh, as I said, the only team that's ever done it is the JPL team for NASA. Nobody else in the world has successfully done that. And it's because of that work that they do together uh, as a team. Ignition sequence start. All engines are running. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon. We have achieved the earth-shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking, and left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. Every day, every mission, we advance this calling. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. stop at that slide. This was the advertisement for those of you who want to consider coming to NASA. Uh, we need talent there and of course I tried to make Lisa cry. I don't know whether I was successful anymore. <laughs> a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. The transformation of our after, whether it's at NASA, that's where I'm trying to have my impact, whether it's as an educator, whether it's as a, uh, whether it's as a innovator, somebody who builds a company, somebody who works in their community as a politician or otherwise in a hospital. Transformation is hard. And many times along the way, it feels like it's not going anywhere. So the, the moments of triumph that we see are not the most important part of that activity. The moments of triumph we see is vision and action coming together in the face of reality sometimes, trying, you know, overcoming challenges that are huge. And, and with it, all of a sudden, creating a new reality that nobody else could even think of uh, years ago. So that's what I hope uh, I can uh, talk to you about. That's all, uh, what I hope you will take with you uh, tonight. And I thank you for that. Well, I just have to thank Dr. Zubrukin for an incredible job. And I don't know if he under knows this, but we are in the middle of our next big plan. And our big plan is to dream big and to convert that into action. So what a great motivational message for how our vision, combined with the action of incredibly passionate individuals, can transform our university and the lives of our students. And I hope you all take note because while we may not be going to the stars, our reach will certainly be to the heavens. Thank you so much again, and what a wonderful speech. <laughs> as opposed to making a long comment. You get one question. You don't get a follow-up unless he says it's OK. And that way, we can hear from as many of you as possible uh, and really extract everything that we can from this incredible talk and from the vision that he's brought uh, to NASA as its chief scientist. So with that, we have microphones set up here. If you're interested in asking a question, please come on down. Don't be shy. 
interaction's a good thing. What is the current situation in terms of funding from the uh, Trump administration? Do you feel that they're, and I know this is a difficult question, that, that they're uh, very supportive of the future of NASA, or do you feel like you're being constrained now in terms of budget? Uh, I like that question. It's actually a good time to ask the question because we just got a budget passed uh, last week, right? So we look at that budget, the budget for science, for the budget for NASA is $21.5 billion. It's the largest budget we've had uh, for decades. Uh, the budget for science is $6.9 billion. It's the largest budget we've ever had. So, so basically, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, we can, you know, uh, credit or blame one administration. The, the reason uh, that is, is because the government, the, the government structure the process in governance, you know, we can all make jokes about it at times, but it works. It's kind of an ugly process, but, you know, so there's a proposed budget, and then there's a big discussion um, uh, on the Hill, the, you know, with the Senate, with the House, and at the end what comes out and what's being signed into law is the budget, the only budget that matters is the one that's signed. Now, in this case, we had some, you know, kind of a little bit of a break before we got there, but the short and the long is uh, uh, right now we have a, a lot of support by a variety of stakeholders, and what's really exciting about NASA, we're really bipartisan. I mean, it, it, it's really not uh, a case like some of the agencies that kind of do better in one or the other administration. You know, I think NASA, uh, just like uh, what I talk about, I don't think anything that I said here is in any remote way partisan, and I think that that's why uh, people can rally behind it, and I think that's what, what we're seeing. It's a, a great vision, and uh, we have a lot of support. Uh, it's not my, even if if that budget was less, so kind of my goal is actually not to talk about uh, the budget uh, in a sense of, uh, you know, could I do more if there's more, more budget, without doubt. But see, that's not my job. My job is, uh, and our job here at NASA is to do the absolute best we can for you, the taxpayer. I'm also a taxpayer, by the way. The absolute best I can for the taxpayer, you know, and do the most uh, impact, kind of tell those stories out there and create those transformations that benefit uh, of course, the world, uh, but very much benefit the United States and its economic base. Thank you. Thanks so much, sir. Oh, sorry. Next question. Hi. Um, mine's more about kind of the curiosity on how you manage your teams and, and keeping people so passionate and so precise through years of a project and, and everything you're talking about that goes into it. I mean, how I can imagine it's almost an obsession. Uh, coming from everybody, but I, I'm just kind of curious how you keep everybody on the same page. You know, the one thing that's really, I mean, I, I love that question, and, and I, kind of, I wish I could give the recipe fully. I mean, you know, the, the one thing that, that I believe in, kind of, whether it's at NASA or anywhere else, often we don't spend enough time talking about the why. Like, we're really mired down with the how and the what, and, you know, we're, and we're talking about details and so forth, and we're not talking about the why. I think the one thing about uh, our teams that I'm observing is they understand the why. Like if they go home and talk to their families about what they're doing. So when we do our annual survey that is kind of done in all around government, the one place we're scoring off the charts is the purpose. Uh, we, people understand the why. See, if you get the why, that's that vision. If you get the why, the, make no mistake, without the vision, it's really hard to motivate. Because sometimes, you're like up to here in mud. But you look at the stars, you say, that's where we're going. I'm not gonna give up now. I already passed this and this rock. So the vision, it's that looking at these stars that pulls you forward. And I think kind of that we're really fortunate in NASA that uh, our uh, community, our people, not just the ones on the inside of the agency, our com community and universities that work there, they understand the why. And so, so that, that's what I would say is the answer. Sometimes, every once in a while, I think we have a special breed of people too. Like kind of we have people who are more reserved. I've been in meetings, you know, like in most, most meetings, like nobody would show up. And, you know, I've been in meetings, like, I mean, even in my own, working on an NASA project, that, like, kind of the, probably the, the thing I still, like, it's just like there's these moments where you get it, right? This, so I basically, like, I had this problem with this instrument that went to Mercury later, right? And kind of an instrument, I sat there, and we basically were failing. And I remember I, I paid pizza for everybody. And basically just in the room and basically said, look, here's the problem. Uh, 
this is gonna be really hard. The only way we're gonna make this is we're all pulling together. I remember this guy, like, you know, every team has a squeaky wheel. Like I actually like the squeaky wheel. I want somebody to remind me that what we're saying may be wrong. Like I, I want that. At least the, the squeaky wheel always kept them really close to me because like sometimes he discouraged people almost a little bit too much. He was all the way at the other side of the room and he basically said, of course we're gonna be successful. Like he stood up right there because he realized this is the moment we have to come together, right? It's not the squeaky wheel moment. It's the moment we're all pulling together because he realized that the guy in charge, me, he's not gonna be successful if he's not pulling with him. You know, and it's these kind of moments as leaders, you'll never forget when it happened for the first time. You, you recognize it again. So, so there's also leadership style that comes from that. Doing extraordinary risky things, there's a leadership style that comes from that. And you're fortunate if you're on a team like that. Some of you have been in the military, uh, that the many of the people in the military that I work with, they're really good at this. They get the why, just the same way. And they pull together and, uh, and, and can do amazing things together. But thanks for the question. It's all about the why. I'm wondering more about personal transformations. What was a big obstacle, maybe the biggest obstacle you faced in your career progression <laughs> and getting through it? When I was kicked out at home, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, so I grew up uh, in a family that didn't have any academics. I was the first one in my family to graduate. I know many of you are that way. I always thought that was a strength that I had, not a weakness, but it took a while to recognize that. So I had nobody who told me about universities, and I remember when all of a sudden I, I did this test. Somebody, you know, it was mandatory in school to do a career test, like what's the career you should be doing? What came out for me is a mix between scientist and engineer. By the way, that's what I'm not, right? By the way, it's like lots of scientists. What do they do? Never met one. Uh, engineers? Uh, are these the guys on trains? What, what are, you know? So, so I, I, I tried to figure out, and I realized I need to do a higher education. So I went to my teacher, and I told him, I, I think I want to go to a higher education. And he tried to talk me out of it, kind of that moment, right? And, and so, so kind of, by the way, you know, uh, that will happen. That will happen. Uh, people try to talk you out of it, and uh, remember, I was a professor at the University of Michigan and so forth, and I went to his town, and at the place where he shopped, I dropped off a business card and said, many regards. <laughs> I know it's not, it, I should be better than this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, like at the end, you know, so, so it's really there early on. The one thing that helped me in every case kind of the counteraction, kind of the, the things that were really kind of career obstacles that, you know, I basically I was not sure it's ever good. I barely made it, by the way, in that higher level. Barely. I'm horrible at languages. Because of French, I made it. Because I had a better teacher than my math teacher, right? I barely made it. I never had anything less than an A. I failed math, the exam. I wasn't prepared, right? So, so that's the biggest, kind of in many ways, kind of if you look back at my career, that's the biggest step. All the rest, kind of later, what helped me, and I'm gonna turn your question around, what helped me is whenever there was an obstacle, there were mentors next to me who had the best in mind. And so what I would tell any student, do not be worried about asking for help. Uh, by the way, every faculty too. I still have mentors that I keep right next to me. By the way, also mentors who said, you're wrong. That's a good mentor too. They just said, you're wrong, you need to back up. You know, I remember uh, first grad student I had, you know, he didn't do what I wanted. You know, it's like he wasn't as fast that I expected him to be. And I went to my boss, uh, who was a really accomplished guy, a member of the academy, he was at NASA. I think they have the same job I have now, many years ago. He's my mentor, right? So I said, we need to fire this guy. He's no good. And he said, uh, so he leaned back and he put the shoes up on his desk. And he looked at me. Oh, when we're having this discussion, I'm just remembering how many times somebody had to give me a break. He didn't say you're wrong. I never forgot that. It's the best lesson. So he told me no, right? But he told it to me in a way that I'm like, I'm so dead wrong. My job as an educator is to make that student successful, not to fire him, right? And so, so that's what he told me. But he said, I needed that help. And of course, I knew I did too. So 
uh, that's, that's what it is. So mentors, uh, have mentors around you uh, that will help you. It's amazing if you ask for help, truly with an open heart, how much help you'll get. It's incredible. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm an electrical engineering student currently at the Nwande of Robotics Engineering for NASA since I was 10. What's the best advice you could give me past never quitting? So first of all, we're hiring a lot of robotics engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, so is the, so is the entire Earth, right? I'm gonna, it's, it's really, it's one of the most needed and most wanted educations right now. It's incredible. I mean, I, I, I also do cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my business card. <laughs> um, look, uh, I believe that the way you get hired into an unusual position is that you check your boxes, you know, you go do your classes, you kind of understand what's there, but then you show in projects and you show in activities what you can do. I mean, I, you know, talking to Elon Musk, and you don't necessarily, I'm not suggesting you want to work for Elon, but I, I think he said something really well. He, he basically said, look, the way I hire, I look for somebody who is extraordinary at what they're doing. In fact, I'm trying to tell myself that I can't find anybody that does what she is doing or he is doing right now better than that particular person. So kind of create excellence in a field by your own initiative. So what that does, it creates a compelling story that makes you stand out. Not enough people do that. So that's what I would do if I wanted to I get there and then, uh, yeah, don't get turned away. Uh, go, go pound some doors, uh, use your network. I know somebody has contacts at NASA. <laughs> so, so, but uh, but there's many more, right? So there's, by the way, it's just a lot of opportunity. And by the way, don't go too narrow. Uh, you know, if you want to work on NASA projects, if that's what you want to do, uh, you may work for NASA, but you may also work for a company, like, uh, I don't know, Lockheed Martin, Ball Aerospace, you know, SpaceX, I mean, we already talked about it. Right. You may look, work, and then create a career evolution towards being kind of uh, a person with a NASA badge. But don't go too narrow too early, uh, kind of when you look at, you search, kind of give yourselves more shots on goals, as we say, you know, and, and, and so that's what I would do. So excel at something really dry, something that, that has your label on it. This is what you did. I kind of put that on your resume. It's incredible how much that does, how many open, how many doors it opens. I think it makes up for 0.4 uh, GPA or 0.5 GPA. The reason I did that, I once did a calculation on, uh, I ran programs, remember, and I'm a geek, so, so what I did is, I did a calculation for uh, GPA on experiences and how many job offers per person. And basically, people who did that, they basically moved their, they moved their chances up so substantially that, uh, that they made up for, uh, for a lesser GPA uh, by that alone. And if you do both, you know, you're, you're golden. Great, well, thank you. Of course. Hi, um, I saw a NOVA program this week that showed the CubeSats and talked about the private rocket companies. So I wanted to know how you are, how NASA is sharing or are they sharing with you? Are you sharing technology? Are you sharing of the vision? And how are you guys working with the private sector on those kinds of things? I love that question. So the way the rule we have, the rule we implement, Whenever the private sector can do it, we're not doing it ourselves, basically, just zero time. So the private sector can do launch vehicles. We used to build all the launch vehicles. We're not building launch vehicles anymore, except one where we can't buy it, the really ultra-heavy one, space launch uh, system. Uh, all the others uh, we're buying in the open market. So CubeSats are really interesting. Right? CubeSats actually grew out on the outside of NASA. In many ways, NASA was actually trying to fight them initially. I remember I worked for the academies before I went to NASA and did a report on CubeSats, and it was really clear that most of the progress was on the outside of NASA, and then we adopted it on the inside. So it's, it's kind of a classic kind of disruptive innovation story. You know, it's actually worse than a regular spacecraft, but you can do many more, so, so it's that kind of thing. So, so what we're doing with CubeSats is, first of all, uh, we're actually investing in that. We're, we're actually helping uh, the companies that are there uh, to build those CubeSats, but what we're also doing, if there's a company out there that has a business model, like imaging the Earth, you know, Planet, Spire, uh, 
digital globe, you know, companies like that, that image the earth with uh, small spacecraft, we actually create acquisition models in which we buy those data and make it available for science. So what we're trying to do is not build cube sets that are just as good that are out there in the private sector. We're trying to be a customer, right? So we're trying to be a customer, whether it's for launch vehicles, like we already said, but also for, for small spacecraft and cube sets. Uh, in some cases, we're actually trying to help them launch so they can get out there and uh, you know, using our space station resupply, we actually help them launch for, uh, for less money because we want them to be successful in the US. You know, NASA is a really important part of our economy. We are trying to grow entire commercial sectors. Uh, last year alone, $3.5 billion was invested in space uh, in kind of diluted funding of the, you know, like venture capital and, uh, and similar type of funds. And that's because the, the world sees that yes, the government is a customer, but so are others. We don't want to be the only customer. Because if we're the only customer, it makes no sense, right? Because we don't control what we're doing uh, and we're paying for it. It's like, that, 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 that's not good news for the taxpayer, right? We want to be one of several customers and then we want to buy services. So what we're really trying to do is learn how to do it. I'm not saying it's easy. Because what we have to do, basically, like walk up to uh, one of our really good employees and basically say, hey, you used to do this. We're done. We're buying it in the private sector. Like, of course, it doesn't work quite that black and white. But you sense that no matter how we say it, that's how our great employees hear it. And that's, that's really a, a challenge, right? But that's what change looks like. By the way, that's how success looks like. Uh, when I'm at uh, Kennedy and I drive over the base and I look, of course, the NASA towers and I realize there's like four companies there now that are building launch uh, launchers, I'm, it just makes me feel so good. There's no country in the world that is like this, in which the private sector is so healthy. Uh, we went from something like 20% market share of the international launch market to close to 80%. That's because of the private companies. And so I'm really proud of that, and I'm proud that NASA is a customer for that, uh, for that kind of market. Uh Nowadays, uh, big data and artificial intelligence are very hot topics, especially for the organizations who own like a big data. They always, cl they always claim that they can achieve like better performance than human beings. So NASA, apparently you have got a lot of data and you have got a lot of experts. So when it comes to like critical missions, uh, will you rely on like uh, artificial intelligence or human being, which one how, how you balance this kind of thing? Uh, we'll always rely on both, right? Because we need uh, judgment. But artificial intelligence is a really critical, or however you call it, deep learning, you know, like, uh, it's, it's a really critical element. And frankly, uh, from where I'm sitting, I think we're actually, I mean, we're, we're spending quite a lot of time trying to figure out how we can boost it. Uh, and the simple reason for that is, is that I feel that there's more, and, and I'm not the only one, by the way, I'm not even the most important one, but you know, like our uh, science community, our international community feels that there's a lot more opportunity to have impact with the data that we have right now. Uh, more discoveries that are there. And we, we just, sometimes there are data sets where we're only looking at a small fraction of the data just because the human lifespan is too short. You know what I mean? And you pick out a data set and you know, you don't look left and right. And sometimes left and right are the big discoveries. So I think, uh, I don't think of artificial intelligence as something that's totally separated from the human, right? At the end, kind of I think of it as an extension of our experience, kind of to, to create scale uh, to, our, uh, to our experience and also uh, to kind of uh, touch the data in new ways that we can't with a uh, spatial scale or a, a temporal scale of a grad student, for example. So uh, we think it's important. There are philosophic discussions one can have about artificial intelligence as it comes to robots. We're not there yet. Uh, eventually, that's a discussion we need to have. But right now, it's really about data analysis and science discovery. That's where, I'm, that's where I see uh, tremendous uh, uh, value. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm a preschool teacher. And so I know that the young kiddos that I work with are going to be entering a workforce of jobs that don't even exist yet. And so um, I'm just curious if you have an idea about what maybe the most important skills um, might be to uh, instill in 
them or support them as they begin to explore their role. Wow, it's great to hang out with three schoolers, you know. Sometimes I wish my kids were still there. They're teenagers now. It's like, wow, here used to be so easy. Anyway. <laughs> to do the kind of things that uh, we need to do, and things, by the way, also in other domains that are critical, like finding cures for big illnesses and so forth. I think there's uh, at least two uh, fundamental uh, characteristics that anybody needs to bring to the table. The first one is that they learn something really well. I actually don't really care what that is. Many people think about STEM. I think about STEM all the time. But not everybody needs to be a STEM person. I actually think we need artists that are really critical. I'm not just saying it because of you. Uh, I actually think many times, I, 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 you see these slides? That's because we have an artist. Like there's no way a scientist can do slides like this. It's, it's like somebody, I mean, because the communication of what we're doing is better done through the tools of art than the tools of science. Can put every question, any equation out there that you want. I cannot touch it that way. So, so there's something they're really good at something. But the other thing is that they're able to work together. And what that requires is kind of a recognition of the importance of diversity in all dimensions. So that sounds like a really wow. That's like well, why does he bring that in? There is nothing that's more important in decision making around the table when I'm at the top of the table and I make a decision for a billion dollar investment, yes or no. I don't want groupthink. I want people who push each other. I want people who have different backgrounds that are bringing up different viewpoints, and that's what I'm talking about. The biggest challenge, I would argue, that, that I'm facing sometimes in some environments, and it's not in our team. Our team is, is really in that. It is, is that recognition that we need to have that diversity of opinions bringing together and and building the teams that can do this. So those are the two things, right? The recognition of that. I think by these two things mean that there's a kind of a common vocabulary, a common set of experiences that really matters. I tell you what worries me, and I, frankly, I'm interested in, in uh, your opinion and others, right? Because what really worries me is that uh, even though we're kind of at the, at the high time of science, I gave you a few examples. There's many more. I could talk for hours with equally exciting kind of highlights. We are not managing to, to get a common understanding of what science even is in a, in a public discourse. You know, like uh, recently I bumped into a, a guard in one of our NASA facilities and he asked me whether the Earth is flat. And I thought it's a joke. It was not, right? And, and, and so, by the way, I'm perfectly fine that people don't know these things, but I'm, I'm like, we really failed somewhere. That, uh, that 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 discussion is a real discussion. So for me, uh, I think part of it is also us learning how to talk about science, uh, how to kind of show what science means and how uh, what it what show what innovation means, kind of how it manifests itself, how it feels, kind of in a way that perhaps we haven't been as successful as we should have. So it's really depth in a discipline, but the ability of working with teams and kind of my puzzle, uh, like how did we miss? Uh, such a large fraction of our uh, great country and elsewhere uh, that just really don't understand kind of what this actually is because it's so great to work on it. Thanks for the work you do. It's really important. So I see two more people lined up. Do you think you have two more in you? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. So we're going to start up top, come down to the bottom, and then we're going to let Dr. Zerbrucken continue his evening. Uh, and let's hear from you. Thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. You um, talked about vision that has been coupled with action that has already produced transformation. Can you share with us some visions that NASA is currently acting on to produce future transformation? So uh, I, I mentioned one of them, right? The James Webb Space Telescope is something that we're nowhere near transformation. Uh, we're, we're still in integration and test. So we'd like to learn about the origin of uh, the, the universe, the beginning of the universe. We'd like to learn about life elsewhere. I didn't talk much about that. That telescope is actually the best tool we're currently developing worldwide to uh, study atmospheres of some planets. Only few. When, by the way, we didn't know that there's that many ex exoplanets when, when it was started. So the, 
that the whole science program is changing. So that, that's that. I talked kind of the, the other vision is really focused on bringing humans out of low Earth orbit uh, towards the moon and Mars, really learning how to do that and through that opening up new ways of exploring uh, the solar system, new ways of exploring our environment and transcending the boundaries that we have here. Uh, those are only two uh, of, the, of the visions, kind of one more in the science, one more in the human exploration uh, that, that uh, keeps us uh, awake at night. Yeah. So my question is, what is the relationship moving forward with NASA and the U.S. military? Uh, just as, as broad as you want to be uh, beyond just, just national security? So uh, we feel we're really complementary uh, to the science activities in this country, right? On the one side, uh, the purpose of the, uh, the activities of the military is about national defense and understanding uh, situational awareness. Uh, we're about the kind of stuff that you just saw here, exploration, we're about that. And, and uh, there's tremendous wisdom, I believe, in the United States to have both of the agencies. We share the same workforce in many ways. So basically, uh, some of these, some of these uh, activities that uh, we're working on here, they're only possible uh, because of developments that happen over there. Uh, some of uh, the development that happen over there are only possible because of things we do. Uh, many of the companies actually really love to work on both because of the fact that uh, for all the obvious reasons, you talk more about one than the other uh, part of the, the business space. So, so, so for us, uh, uh, they are uh, distinct and they are uh, different in, it, in their purpose, uh, that they are uh, the same workforce. They're kind of, if you want, they're, uh, you know, have at the, the same at their, at their heart, which is to, uh, uh, to really, uh, you know, in many ways, demonstrate, extend uh, kind of uh, what this country can do and, the, uh, and strengthen the, economies that, the economy that is here and also inspire in the case of, uh, of NASA. So they, they relate to each other, uh, but not in a direct way. So, so we, I don't spend half of my time, if you want, you know, with that other space. Uh, we, we, we do have things where we overlap, but, but uh, kind of not many hours per week, you see? I mean, kind of it really is two complementary uh, parts uh, with the same workforce. Both of them important. Yeah. Well, I just want to say I'm so inspired. You've talked to us about taking risks. You've talked to us about vision. You've talked to us about the actions that someone has to take. And you've talked to us about failure and collaboration and things that are really important in order for NASA to, in some ways, expand our understanding and our natural curiosity about the universe around us and to offer more options for how humans will exist in the future. And I'm just going to submit to you that as an institution of higher education, we do exactly the same thing. Absolutely. We explore, we discover, we use our curiosity and our imagination to create more possibilities for humans in the future. And it's nice to know that we're united in this quest, and it's great that you've served as such an exemplar and such a motivator for an audience who I know is hungry for this kind of discourse. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbrook, and how about a big round of applause? Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. You've also set an incredibly high bar for the next presidential <laughs> lecture series, uh, and I just hope we can do something that can at least hang in there with you. So thank you again. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate it.